Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Simon Edwards, and I will be your moderator today. And on behalf of the IMECI Tribology Group, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on the topic of the tribology of wind farms. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome two fantastic speakers for you today, focusing on both the operational and the technical aspects of wind turbine technology. In terms of format, each presentation will be 20 minutes in duration, and we will plan for a combined question and answer session at the end of, of this session. So please feel free to share your questions via the online chat. Uh, I will pick them up and I will uh, feed them to our expert presenters for you. So uh, without any further delay, I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, who is Tom Kent. By way of introduction, Tom Kent is Lead Offshore Operations and Maintenance Engineer with Scottish Power. Tom is a Chartered Mechanical Engineer with Scot uh, Chartered Mechanical Engineer, sorry, with experience in a range of tribology and wind turbine related, role, related roles with Kittywake, Vestas, Centrica, and a startup company focusing on leading edge erosion mitigation products. Today, Tom will be sharing some operational aspects of wind turbines with a specific focus on tribology. So, over to you, Tom. Right, thank you very much. Let me just put my screen up and hopefully you should all be seeing what I'm seeing. So, uh, the introduction there, Simon, that's very kind of you. Okay, uh, so, uh, technology in, in turbines has uh, very much sort of been evolving and really to understand uh, the sort of tribology side of it, we really need to sort of see how the actual industry itself and the turbines themselves have actually developed over time. So uh, first thing to sort of talk about is, yeah, the phenomenal rate of growth that we've actually seen within the wind industry. Uh, if you go back a few years to the sort of um, 80s and 90s, you had relatively small, fast moving turbines, which were actually uh, measured in the sort of kilowatt range. Uh, and when you, you know, tens of kilowatts, sometimes hundreds of kilowatts. But that was the start, and it sort of uh, paved the way to then uh, for things to develop. And now, uh, trying to sort of put it into context, the latest turbines that are that have got actually prototypes that are being developed at the moment, and then that should, should be installed this year, uh, are are now with a rotor diameter instead of as you see there from little sort of 30, 40 meter rotor turbines these ones now the biggest i believe is going to be 222 currently but every year and every every few months in fact someone develops an even bigger one the the rate of development is is, is incredible um so that's really good but with this uh, massive increase um the actual sort of development is some way split into to different sort of phases with certain people doing one design of turbine others doing other designs of turbines and again of what's physically possible because what you find is by about the size of turbines that were being produced in the early 2000s for a lot of places onshore that was as large as turbines could get because you cannot get you know once you once you get to a sort of about 100 meter rotor diameter trying to get sort of blades any bigger than that to <clears throat> anywhere onshore is hard because trying to get through villages and towns and things especially in the uk it's hard so the the sort of size of that the tech and the um the technology may be slightly different per turbine, but basically they've just been trying to get them as more efficient um, and more reliable as possible is what they've done onshore, but just not really get the size. But for those which are either very close to, to somewhere you can you can actually get to the sea or particularly of the offshore stuff, which I, I deal with mostly, you know, obviously size isn't the limit. So you can actually, in some ways, it's it's it limits become in other ways. It's how well you can make the foundations and the, how big the actual jackup vessels are that you can get out to put these things up. So these have really grown and grown and grown and have become an amazing way because the larger the turbine, the larger the swept area, the larger the capacity, and um, it's it's just a better way to do it. So you have somewhat split into those sort of things. And what you'll find is you can should see the two pictures of the turbines that you have on the screen here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you'll find that whereas geared turbines were certainly what started this off, now uh, on these two turbines that you see here, for example, you have huge generators with no gearbox, which are just mounted directly onto the actual hub. And then 
uh, you, those are generally magnets, permanent magnet generators where you have a, a stator inside to take off the power. And so it's a very different design. But to try and sort of understand this, it's, as I said, it's, it's good to try and get the idea of the actual scale. Here's just one picture just that I really liked. I thought I'd put in here. Yes, that is a blade for a turbine. And yes, that is a person at the end. You can see the actual the scale here. This is an uh, inside. You can see a step ladder. And yes, there are 12 steps on that step ladder, a normal step ladder. And it's nowhere near the top. You could when you say you could drive a bus into the root of this, they mean that you could drive a bus into the root of this thing. It is enormous. And when you consider that this there is an 80 meter blade and some of the ones that are coming now are well over 100 meter blades, the, the, the newer ones are even bigger than the one you see here. So it just really puts you into the sort of context of what sort of technologies you were trying to do. And again, what sort of size bearings, look at the root of those sort of things that you, you've really got to make. So on to a bit more troubleology. So um, gearboxes are what was the real start uh, uh, of turbines. Certainly, they were the, one, the things that were used uh, mainly. And what you'll find is originally when turbines were very small and very fast spinning, you had relatively standard industrial designed gearboxes or parallel boxes, which were fine and they were pretty good. Weren't always as reliable as possible, but in time, you know, they realized that as turbines are getting bigger, you really need some certain thing, uh, some certain uh, designed specifically for the wind industry. And that is a sort of a good picture. The middle picture on the right is an idea of the sort of gearboxes you'd find in most, especially land-based turbines, where you actually now, because as uh, rotors get bigger, actually the RPM of the rotors get smaller. And, and the reason that the RPM has to, has to slow down is because you need to keep the tip speed below a certain range. Uh, and, the, and the main reason for that is because the faster you go, you, you can cause leading edge erosion. And that will be covered by Hamish later. But that is the reason you have to do it. So um, as, as these new sort of custom gearbox have got out there, lots of people got burnt because, unfortunately, the reliability things weren't the greatest. And there's been many different sort of designs. But now I think we've got to a point where we're relatively stable. Actually, they're relatively reliable now. Actually, pretty, pretty good bits of kit considering the abuse that you actually get from the environment what we'll find is um now though when you're moving offshore as i said quite a few have gone to permanent magnet generators so you don't have a gearbox at all but in some ways are better and what looks actually slightly more efficient by the numbers but it's very hard to compare one turbine to another in reality uh, is that if you actually have a combination of actually what is now a medium speed gearbox which is just uh, two or three um, planetary sections, and then you link it to a smaller permanent magnet generator, you get the best of both worlds, and actually you get a, sort of a relatively reliable and a, re a relatively powerful drivetrain in your turbine. And that is, you know, one of the sort of main designs, the most popular ones out there at the moment. Um, your systems also have uh, gearboxes, so to move the nacelle around to the direction of the wind, you do need uh, some gearboxes, and usually you'll have maybe a dozen, maybe more of these very high ratio drives like you see at the bottom here. And these uh, high ratio drives in, in the bottom here, they're like a thousand to one. They have a lot of torque and often a brake on them as well to sort of hold the turbine in position. Uh, along with that, if, if most turbines have a hydraulic pitch system, but if you don't, then some, some of the pitch systems are actually run by having, again, one of these sort of type of drives on the blades. And so you can actually uh, to, to feather the blades and move the blades around. You can use a gearbox to do that. And so, of course, in all the gearboxes, you also have oil. Uh, oil is um, uh, obviously very critical. When, when turbines first started, yes, most of them were filled with mineral oil. And mineral oil is fine, and, and it does, does work. But often turbines are put in... Uh, uh, areas which are, you know, could be deserts or can be very cold. I mean, everywhere from sort of northern Canada down to the Sahara Desert. And you'll find that um, some place, especially desert, can be very hot, hot in the daytime, but also freezing cold at night. And so that difference was was very hard for the oil to actually cope. And the, the viscosity changes were massive. So most, well, everyone now has really moved to synthetic uh, because synthetic oils just have that advantage of better VI and other things. It is, it is. It also means that they last a lot longer. Uh, the other f uh, thing you'll see within the turbines, they used to have on the early turbines incredibly basic filtration systems. I mean, incredibly basic, uh, literally boulder catcher type things, because I didn't think there'd be much contamination in, in, in a place like that at the top of a top of a 50 meter pole. 
But now uh, they've realized that, you know, bearings and gears and stuff produce their own uh, debris and wear and actually systems getting very dirty. So they used to uh, always fit these sort of fine filtration systems onto onto them. And this would take out all the fine particles and, and vastly improve the uh, uh, cleanliness of the oil. And they were a great thing. But again, as time has gone by, the manufacturers have gone, OK, why, why bother them retrofitting them? We'll have them on from day one. And so you'll find these fitted to all modern gearboxes now. And in fact, better than those, you know, huge, great uh, filtration systems compared to what they were a long time ago. When you wear these large turbines now, you can have well over a ton of oil. So, OK, how do you change the oil in these things? It's uh, trying to do this on land is, is hard enough where you have to get basically a tanker turns up to the bottom of your turbine. If it can drive up on the sort of roughly made roads around these things, you get a large hose. You pull a hose up, you suck out the old oil, you put in the new oil um, and give it give it a good flush around and then, sorry, put in the new oil. Uh, and that's really how it works. Um, what you'll find is um, whilst they're trying to actually uh, do that, you know, there is risks of, you know, contamination and actually getting to the right place. So it is really is um, a, a really a, a painful thing to do and an expensive thing to do. But. If you're trying to do offshore, imagine then the complexities where you're having to do the same thing, but off a moving vessel. And then the turbines up there, you know, you're, you're lifting to well over 100 meters on some turbines. So the actual health and safety uh, issues like are very high. So the best thing to do is either never change your oil. Unfortunately, that's a bit hard at the moment or do it as minimum as possible. It used to be that you'd get, say, three years out of mineral oil. But now with synthetic, then you get normally at least five. But we use oil analysis um, every year at least um, to sort of see how the oils are going. And actually, most of the time, it says that after five years, oils are fine, absolutely fine. And uh, But you will start seeing um, degradation of the additive packages. So what we find is now the suppliers are offering actual um, additive top-ups that you can put in with it, specifically made for the turbines. Uh, all out and now we're looking at sort of a 10 year life and if you think about it most turbines are planned at least to try and last 25 years that's the sort of life we're looking at it so if you get to say 12 and a half then you only have to do this once and suddenly that is a, a massive cost saving and a massive health and safety uh, improvement as well the only other things that, that have, have caused uh, turbines real issues in the past are bearings, and especially main bearings. There are many sites out there still now which have bearing issues. Um, and it, uh, it's bad enough for geared turbines, which which have often have a main shaft or an ingrit in built bearing into the actual turbine. Uh, but for the for the direct drives, uh, these have to have huge bearings. I mean, I believe the latest ones are about five meters in the in the newest turbines, five meter diameters. So these things are huge. Often now they sort of taper rollered. There used to be a lot of spherical roller bearings, but those not so popular anymore. They've certainly more gone to the taper roller bearings uh, just for reliability purposes. And that and that is really good. As I say, some are oil fed, but a lot of these are grease fed. Or we'll come sort of in a minute um what are some of the biggest issues we've had um up to now are actually issues um with uh, actually materials because the problem is making turbines this big and bearings this big uh, you'll find out that very few manufacturers could make these and every single time a manufacturer goes out and buys a new bigger mach uh, you know machining system or lathe or or machine to actually make these and do these in a big production but we're not talking about one off your bear and um, you know your bearings you're talking about uh trying to produce hundreds of these things a year um if they try and do this uh they struggle because it's a prototype one every time trying to find decent quality material of that size trying to find machines that can do it of that size and so yes we in the hardening process and stuff there have been a, there have been a lot of issues and there's certainly material defects and white edge cracking and the hydrogen embrittlement and all these sort of things and those have been a real problem We're trying to get them out and most of the time you can solve that over time with decent controls within your uh, processes. But unfortunately, every time you make these, it's literally a prototype every time. In fact, the development of these have often been held up by the bearing manufacturers because they just physically cannot make big enough bearings for us. OK, and so those are grease, but there are other um, 
uses for grease within within the turbine especially for things like generator bearings and blade and pitch bearings and then the actual sometimes as we said is there's your um the the pitch and your I the pitch, uh, gears uh there, there is um uh and so what they've done is so there's a lot of grease use uh and suppliers um you know started to produce actual products for wind specifically for this which which is nice that we used to use standard industrial stuff, but now they have custom made stuff. What we find is it's, it is rather messy. Um, we particularly have issues with uh, grease in any of the rotating parts, any of the things on things like the blade bearings or in the, anything in the hub. Uh, if it leaks into the hub or, for example, grease catches or things come loose, bounce around inside the hub. When the hub is the size of a very large room, you imagine how long it takes to clear it up afterwards because you can't have people have got to walk over any of those surfaces and you can't have these slippery greasy surfaces around so there has been quite a few issues and it can be quite a mess the other issue is it used to be the fact is we started sort of uh greasing turbines using a grease gun and there you'd put in you know four to four or six months worth of, of you know grease all the time in them um and uh, what you'd find is of course you would chuck that much grease in at any one time it instantly comes out of the seals uh and it, and it makes the right mess so you've got these beautiful white sort of turbines with nasty grease leaking out it just doesn't really give the right uh clean uh eco appearance that you really want in the wind industry but that did happen but because of that we worked out that people retrofitted the auto lube system where you just battery powered things that just point a little bit of grease every now and again those work very well and actually what we found is now as standard, because these um, bearings are so critical, they've now fitted as standard most of these full progressive um, grease systems, which um, produce um, specific amounts of grease to all the different parts. Um, and those have been very good and very reliable. Uh, and we like them. It means you only have to fill up one thing. that They've produced equipment to fill those stations much faster, which also helps. But it also there is a monitoring. So you know that how much grease is left when you're running, you know, when you're going to run low on it and if the grease has actually got to the right place. So those are those have been a, a big development for uh, turbines. Then it comes to monitoring. Turbines now, modern ones, have so many sensors. There are There is so much to do on them. Um, you'll find that there is <laughs> thousands of temperature sensors uh, on them, but obviously we have ones for all the drivetrain components and bearing components. Uh, and pumps and everything or hydraulics and pressures and everything those are in there and so from that we can do a lot of monitoring for any of the bearings we have particle sensors um, which are surprisingly good because we'll we'll talk about vibration in a minute but that is something that if you're getting chunks in and gearbox oil it, they can detect so especially the ferrous and non-ferrous ones the optical ones are okay sometimes they suffer from aeration but but again they, they're a nice thing to have on your turbine to know what's going. Vibration is now fitted as standard. It, it, first of them didn't have them. Then they realized how good it was and they started retrofitting them. Now, of course, it's it's standard on such an expensive piece of kit. And those are now vastly more developed than they used to be. And they are highly reliable. But the problem is now, as we said, you're going to get turbines that are running at only 7, 8 RPM trying to detect any damage at that lower rpm is very hard it can be done but it isn't as easy as you'd, you'd hope you know most vibration systems are running at much much higher systems and again there's now we do oil and grease analysis so you can take samples you can send them to the lab and you can sort of find out what's happening and these are all great little sort of developments so okay we've talked a lot about sort of what we've done what do we sort of see is going to happen in the future well as i said extending the oil life getting it down to one oil change or maybe who knows no oil changes that would be a really uh, good development from us um again you uh, we'd love some new developments in things like main bearings and how, how they work and all sorts of uh you know gear wear all sorts of things that we'd love to have new technologies from out there but the fact is we want proven technologies that are not risky we do not like risk if you think it's expensive you know changing your car gearbox oh my goodness try doing it offshore it can be millions of pounds and then if you do a mistake that goes to an entire fleet of turbines which has happened multiple times now offshore there are sites that have been out there and had every gearbox changed by massive jack up 
uh, once a year uh, in the first few years till they realized, you know, till, till they got to the sort of bottom of a fault, which was just small material defects in, in bearings. But that cost us, or had cost the uh, supplier at least, millions, and tens if not hundreds of millions. It, it virtually bankrupted one of the biggest uh, wind turbine manufacturers by having issues like that. Uh, I believe we need online grease analysis. I, I, don't ask me, but that is something I think people should be thinking about and working on because now there are a lot of grease-fed bearings and we do want to know what's happening in that. And the slower they get, the harder it is, as I said. And again, that goes on to the next point about vibration sensors as well. Um, and it's and there are people like the Catapult and other things who do work with us who are trying to get new technologies out there. And we're very pleased uh, to see new things coming along. So um, that is, you know, that is good. We want to see new things and we like to try things because you'd be amazing how many developments um, are taken from industry and make our lives much better and much deeper. Um, uh, indeed. And I just sum up to say, as you see, Nothing stands still in our industry, and I'm not talking about the turbines at Sway. It really is expanding at a great rate. The turbines are working incredibly well, and it's a really good, fun industry to be in. But we've still got a long way. We are far from perfect, but really is the future. Okay, thank you very much. I, I guess we'll turn you back over to Simon. Thank you very much for that, Tom. That's great. Um, as I said at the beginning of the call, we will have a combined question and answer session. I already see some questions coming in, so we will pose those to Tom at the end of the next session. So um, next, I would like to welcome Hamish McDonald. Hamish is an engineer with the Offshore Renewable Catapult, or ORE Catapult for short. Hamish joined the ORE Catapult in November 2018, following his PhD in wind turbine leading edge erosion. He has a wide range of experience in the renewable sector, including biomass heat and installing small scale wind turbines in the remote mountains of Peru. Within the offshore renewable energy catapult, Hamish is focusing on activities to improve the operations and maintenance practices for offshore renewables. And today, he will zero in on the specific topic of wind turbine blade leading edge corrosion. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Hamish. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon, uh, for the introduction. Um, Tom, sorry to be a pain and be able to leave the call briefing. We had this uh, issue in a rehearsal where the, uh, the slide imprint's still there. Oh, thanks very much. And hopefully you'll join again um, soon. Um, and I can share my slides. Thanks, Tom. Um, all sorted now. Um, hopefully those slides are coming through uh, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, and, and thanks again, Tom, for, for, for that, um, um, that great introductory um, presentation on uh, the offshore wind energy industry and the tri tribological um, uh, considerations. Um, I'm now going on to a topic um, wind turbine blade leading edge erosion, um, which may not be um, classically uh, associated, associated with um, classical tribology, but it's still um, a very crucial consideration within the industry and hopefully it's of interest of those attending today. Um, it's just going to be a brief overview, so I hope I won't miss any um, crucial uh, details uh, along the way, but I'm hoping to cover uh, what is leading edge erosion and why is it um, such a uh, of keen interest um, to our sector. Um, how is it uh, How is it caused and, and how is it characterized and evaluated? And what does this mean for um, the operation and maintenance of, of these wind turbines uh, overall? Uh, and uh, finally, what, what is being done about it in order to um, reduce uh, its effects? So um, I'll start off with um, just uh, Similar to um, Tom's image of one of these large um, blade sections, uh, blade um, blades, um, we can see uh, in the top right-hand corner uh, an image of uh, a, a conventional uh, modern wind turbine blade divided into uh, different sections and with um, particular annotations. Uh, and this side here is the leading edge, and this is what experiences uh, the 
airflow first before it uh, passes over uh, the suction side and, and pressure side uh, air, um, uh, surfaces of the aerofoil, this, um, this particular shape here, uh, all the way along to the trailing edge. Um, and it's found within uh, close to the tip section of the wind turbine blade um, that uh, progressive removal of material um, from, from this leading edge uh, is experienced. And what starts off with as um, small pits, uh, in this example down below of um, some laboratory samples, um, small pits um, gradually lead to larger gouges and larger areas of, of, of surface removal. Um, and this propagates uh, through to the, the lower surfaces of, of the coatings um, right through to the um, uh, composite substrate, um, exposing the, the matrix um, and, and fibers uh, there that are more uh, crucial for the structural integrity of the blade. And this also means for uh, the wind turbine blade overall that it has uh, reduced aerodynamic properties um, and increased drag due to the, the, the increased roughness on the surface of, of the blade and also uh, reduced lift um, due to the fact that you're slightly changing this very specifically designed um, uh, shape of the wind turbine blade. Um, yeah, and this this reduces the efficient energy capture that the turbine is able to achieve. And I've, I've quoted some figures from um, a project that uh, Ori Catapults were involved in uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, along with Tom. Um, and although these uh, percentages are applicable for um, an uh, increase in, in AAP um, um, following repair, um, you can conversely be um, uh, looked at as what would happen for moderate blade erosion if it was left untreated. And you can see that for uh, these small percentages, um, if you count them across a, a large wind farm with a, a, a large number of turbines, this could mean um, a substantial reduction in the rent revenue generated at that wind farm. So that's of uh, particular concern for owner and operators of these, of these wind farms. Okay, so how is it caused? Um, primarily uh, rain droplet impact, although other airborne uh, particles are thought to influence along with um, some weathering factors, temperature, humidity, UV, um, uh, etc. cetera. Um, what also is, is important is uh, how the turbine is operated. Um, although this is a, a very simple uh, physics formula, um, you can see that the energy of impact, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, brushing over the, the precise physics involved um, uh, with the interaction of, of rain droplets, but um, uh, for the uh, the energy of impact um, increases with the square of uh, the velocity, uh, impact velocity, uh, and this impact velocity is made of made up of three um, constituent um, components: uh, the velocity of the blade, uh, the velocity of the particle, uh, and also the wind speed has a, an influence as well. Uh, but by far the greatest um, uh, contributing uh, component is the is the the blade velocity. Um, which is informed by the rot rotational speed of the wind turbine. And we can see that for these, these larger wind turbine um, blades, um, uh, the further out you go along the, uh, the board of the, the blade, um, the tip speed will be greater. Um, so for these larger wind turbine blades, it, um, it can be quite, uh, quite significant for uh, the same rotational speed. Uh, and in fact, um, as Tom alluded to, um, these tip speeds have been um, uh, capped um, in order to um, uh, mitigate the influence of erosion. Uh, the material properties of the surface you're imp impacting on also has a significant influence. Um, the older, smaller turbines didn't, uh, uh, weren't aware of this um, problem and didn't uh, uh, take this into account in, in, in the way the blades were manufactured. Um, but we'll see now that modern turbines uh, at least include some form of leading edge protection in order to um, combat these effects. Whereas in the, the older turbines, um, yeah, it, erosion wasn't experienced um, or it wasn't uh, the effects of erosion weren't felt for uh, a significant period of time. Um, we've noticed in modern wind turbines um, at particular wind farm sites and for particular wind turbines, obviously there's a lot of um, uh, contributing factors that um, notable erosion can occur just after a few, ye few years on, on, on particular blades. Uh, and it's thought that these, um, uh, the rate of erosion is accelerated um, offshore, um, uh, which where we have these larger turbines and larger blades, and they're exposed to a much harsher environment overall. Uh, 
Um, so in this, these tables uh, here, I've just um, tried to um, give an impression of how uh, damage is categorized, um, particularly on the leading edge. And this is taken from uh, the Bolidina guide. And um, we can see um, quite a typical um, five point uh, damage scale um, that is uh, typically used across a range of uh, wind turbine components, but uh, including the blades. I can see the lower categories of, of damage um, allude to cos cosmetic um, uh, damage or very light um, uh, wear and tear, um, whereby you wouldn't um, uh, intervene unless, unless you had to, uh, all the way up to um, critical forms um, of, of, of damage, which either require um, the immediate stop of the turbine um, uh, and uh, immediate intervention as well. Um, so for particular uh, leading edge erosion, um, there'll be certain um, parameters to be looking for in order to, uh, to categorize it. the kind of surface, um, uh, the, the amount of material that's been removed, uh, has the, the, the tape or the leading edge protection been damaged? How far uh, down does the damage go? Um, at, all the way up to um, uh, an open leading edge. Um, so in the next slide, I've just got a couple of examples of um, in-field um, leading edge erosion. And you can see those initial pits that I was talking about that have um, coalesced into larger areas of um, uh, uh, coating removal um, down to this, this filler section. And you can also see in these, these, these darker sections here, we're kind of exposing um, the, the composite material underneath. And the one on the right is a very extreme example. Um, is, uh, if you leave this um, form of damage untreated, um, you can see it spread across the, the surfaces of the blade, down, right th um, down through the layers to the composite material. And um, yeah, in, in a very extreme example, in a public available report online, you can see there's actually a cavity uh, exposing the hollow section of the blade. So yeah, it can be really quite severe um, if you leave untreated and the implications for uh, repair or, or the condition of the turbine are, qu are quite significant. So if we were to uh, alleviate um, uh, the impacts of leading edge erosion, um, we'd obviously, uh, as alluded to in the previous slides, um, we could uh, minimize the lost annual energy production at turbines and wind farms and increase the amount of uh, revenue um, we can achieve. Uh, we'll also be able to reduce um, uh, O&M um, considerations as well. Um, we're, we're, un we're still likely to um, uh, carry out inspection of the blades um, re regardless for other forms of damage. And um, so that's unlikely um, um, to, be um, to be reduced, but you might use um, less costly or um, less uh, uh, risky uh, interventions such as robotic access technicians and use um, robotic technologies instead. Um, and, and by reducing the amount of repairs you have to um, uh, undertake, um, you can reduce the amount of times so you're uh, transiting out to um, a wind farm and offshore. Uh, that, that is quite a significant contribution of the cost. Um, and I, again, as Tom mentioned before, um, if you're doing any removal of components, you require specific vessels, which can be, uh, which are a lot larger and a lot more costly um, uh, to utilize. Um, another um, tangential um, consideration as well is the fact that if you remove this cap on, on, on tip speeds, potentially uh, you could reduce the, the amount of torque loading on, on the drivetrain um, and um, uh, reduce the costs associated um, with those components as well. So how is uh, um, leading edge erosion being combated? Um, so there are three um, main categories um, of leading edge protection available. Um, there are these um, flex flexible coatings, which are similar to the paints at the top coats um, on conventional terminals, but they have um, a lower uh, acoustic impedance. Um, and this uh, means that um, when the particle hits a blade, um, the resulting reflected um, compressional shock wave, um, which can cause micro cracks on the surface, leading to pits uh, and, and further forms of damage, um, the amount of energy that's absorbed is, is reduced. And that's the same for um, other forms, um, such as uh, tapes and erosion shields. And in the pictures, you can see on, on the left-hand side, you see um, three methods of um, implementation. So. Um, spray or roller or, or brush and then uh, or smoothed over. Um, for tapes, um, the idea is that you um, uh, can increase the amount of uh, manufacturing quality with a, a, a 
uh, one piece section um, that can be um, uh, uh, attached to, to the wind turbine in field. And this is typically uh, polyurethane uh, and flexible. Um, but uh, as I'll allude to, there's, there's, there's particular um, considerations you need to take, in, take into account um, for each individual um, um, solution. And there's not a, a, a silver bullet as of yet. Um, the erosion shields, such as soft shells, are quite quite similar to the tapes, except they're, they're thicker in sections and, 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 and more robust. And are particularly um, focused in at uh, uh, being applied to the, the tip of the blade, uh, as you can see down here. Uh, what hasn't been utilized so far um, in the wind energy industry is metallic coatings. And I'm sure Tom <laughs> will appreciate a, a few reasons why, um, due to the dissimilarity between the materials and the adhesion, and, and having a, a, a big piece of metal on, on, the, on the tip of the wind turbine blade uh, for lightning considerations as well. Um, but um, it's something that uh, the, the sector is looking at because uh, in the helicopter industry, uh, and, and nickel oil has, has been used before um, in, in higher tip speed regimes um, for, um, for quite uh, high levels of success. Um, and quite often these lean edge protections measures are applied in situ, potentially where it's already been damaged before and that has implications on the quality of the, of the uh, installation as well. Um, there's other considerations taken into effect um, for paints, but that could be a potentially, potentially affected by humidity uh, and temperature um, when applying this in field uh, as well. Okay, um, and some further considerations um, in addition. Uh, this table uh, is from a, a journal paper um, my, um, my colleague uh, Robbie Herring, um, who uh, looked at an overview of um, the different uh, protection solutions available uh, and some considerations uh, are, are listed in the table. Um, mainly consideration in, in terms of um, uh, laboratory experiments um, and there'll be other factors that aren't um, uh, taken into account here, such as how uh, a, a human technician is able to uh, manually install this, um, what kind of environmental conditions is he installing um, this leading edge protection um, in. Uh, if it's not up to quality, you may see uh, non-uniformity across um, the blade lengths or across the surfaces. Um, for tapes, you might see wrinkles um, if it's not applied properly. Um, for the, the soft shells, um, edge sealing is key for making sure that the, the, the shield is actually properly adhered um, to the wind turbine blade. Um, and the different um, forms of um, protection measures will fail uh, in different um, ways. Um, you'll see tapes potentially peeling um, if they're uh, on localized areas and other, the, the, the tapes and flexible coatings, sorry, the, the paints uh, or flexible coatings uh, may degrade in localized areas. Um, and metallic um, um, uh, shields uh, have also been associated with um, uh, localized catastrophic failure as well. So that's something that's um, uh, difficult to predict at times and would be a concern for a big rotating uh, mass uh, as well. Um, yeah, we can see here the, the, the average erosion resistance um, quantified uh, 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 Qualitatively, um, by my colleague, um, typically the original gel coats of smaller, older wind turbine blades um, weren't thought to be that great. And we kind of moved to these flexible coatings, which were better. Um, and although uh, tapes are thought to be good um, uh, in a laboratory setting, um, there have been issues experienced um, in a practical setting, um, most likely due to the quality of installation and other factors as well. Uh, it's still quite early to tell, but uh, erosion shields, uh, um, their uh, erosion resistance is thought to be much better. Uh, and ideally that's something we'd like to integrate into the, the blade manufacturing process, um, whereby uh, the adhesive um, issues or debonding um, risk due to this stiffness mismatch might be alleviated uh, slightly. Um, also to consider is if you're putting something onto a wind, uh, a wind turbine blade that already has a specifically designed aerodynamic shape, um, what would this mean for the way the energy uh, capture uh, uh, is experienced as well? Okay, um, 
So there are a range uh, of different standards um, or, or recommended practices um, that specifically uh, look at uh, the effects of leading edge erosion and how you test for this or, or for the um, protection measures. Um, there are a range of different uh, rain erosion test rigs around the world, and we have one uh, at our facilities in Blythe um, for testing particular components. Uh, and there'll be various um, parameters to be looking to, to test um, how long you're exposing um, the, the solution to a uh, four, uh, the kind of droplet sizes and rates that you're um, uh, 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 imparting on, on the material, uh, and the specific water properties. Maybe you're inducing some salinity into that. Um, as well as the, the, the properties of the test specimen itself. You may include some other um, factors as well, such as whether an accelerated aging before testing in the rain erosion test rig, including some of the parameters listed here. Uh, and there's been um, efforts um, to evaluate this further, and a, a recent guide was um, brought out in December as part of this COBRA GIP, um, a consortium of different um, turbine manufacturers, um, wind farm owner operators, and LEP manufacturers an attempt to be able to predict um, the erosive strength um, of a particular um, uh, solution based on rain erosion testing uh, and give an impression of the lifetime of, of that particular solution. Um, there's other efforts um, involved in research and development as well. Um, certainly, um, there are differences um, in an erosion that's felt at particular wind turbine sites and for particular wind turbines. Um, so we definitely have to improve the practices in, in which we are um, evaluating this um, in the in the planning and, uh, and, and evaluating stage um, of a wind farm um, life cycle. Um, so that's something that definitely needs to improve. There's also um, some efforts being um, uh, done to uh, uh, look at how curtailment of rotational speed um, could help alleviate the effects of erosion. It's thought that these high rainfall event events, which um, uh, consist of larger droplet sizes and at larger uh, droplet rates, are more uh, of a contributing factor than the, the more common um, uh, uh, lower rainfall events. And potentially you could reduce uh, the rotational speed of the turbine, reduce the tip speed, and therefore reduce the energy of the impact. Uh, but also there's a lot of things to, to consider as well uh, here in terms of the trade-off. Um, the cost of in solution, installing any uh, form of um, uh, rain, rain prediction um, sensor and, and integrating that into the turbine control system, as well as the reduced uh, energy production you, the turbine will experience by reducing its um, rotational speed as well. So that was just a whistle-stop tour um, of um, wind turbine blade leading edge erosion. Um, hopefully it's given you a flavor um, of, of the phenomenon. Um, and I've just listed some points here um, uh, in conclusion. We're still yet to um, uh, have a solution or a silver bullet that will be able to protect um, a wind turbine blade for the duration of a wind turbine's lifetime. Um, this could be uh, 25 or even 30 years now, depending on um, life extension uh, of, of, of a particular wind farm. Um, as Tom has um, suggested in his presentation as well, intervention can be very expensive, um, and particularly offshore when you're utilizing uh, vessels uh, and you're reliant on weather windows. Um, so downtime with turbines um, is a significant factor there. Uh, it's certainly a continuing area of research that um, has a long way to go. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot needs to be done in terms of characterizing the behavior um, of erosion and how different um, application conditions um, uh, can uh, influence uh, the rate of erosion. And but potentially, um, you need to select certain solutions uh, for particular wind farm sites if you know ahead of time of what they're likely to be. And there's still a variety of um, uh, leading edge protection measures um, being developed and tested currently. Um, and I'm sure we'll see um, uh, yeah, uh, some future um, examples that um, uh, may tackle this um, uh, uh, better. Uh, uh, conventionally, um, it was difficult um, for um, in wind energy stake stakeholders to share uh, data and knowledge um, about how they're experiencing um, erosion, um, but we're hoping efforts such as uh, the Bleep project and, and other um, 
uh, joint industry projects as well um, will help uh, will help learn uh, lessons from from individual um, experiences and learn more about um, uh, how this uh, how this uh, topic um, uh, can be alleviated as well. Okay. Well, th thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, Hamish. That was a great presentation. So um, I would now like to open up the session for questions. We've received a number of questions online. Just a reminder, if you do have a question, please submit them using the online chat and I will then pass them to one or both of our speakers here. Um, uh, we have uh, a split of questions around operational topics and around um, leading edge erosion. So I'll start with the operational ones then. So this is a question from Helen Gott. How, you know, how important is predictive maintenance? Uh, very, fine. yeah, uh, very important. Uh, trying to trying to predict what we need to do and how we do it, and getting advanced warning of things is highly critical. There, yeah, there. Uh, the reason the turbines have so many sensors, so much feedback is to try and get to a position where you know you're you you really are sort of doing it purely like that. Uh, so very, very critical. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. And, and a follow on question from Helen as well is uh, a very specific point here. Helen's been trying to find a circuit schematic for a PT100 or PT1000 main bearing sensor. Is that something you could help out with? Unlikely, to be honest. Um, the main bearings, yes, they have sensors, but it's not generally something that, um, I mean, you're also, we're probably not allowed to share the uh, documents from the so unfortunately probably not okay thanks anyway tom um the next question is from jose pedro pegado de silvaneto what is the typical level of instrument redundancy on the drivetrain uh reasonably high as i said there are lots of different temperature sensors within it but those are say are, are not the most reliable things to, to, to uh, use for prediction but there is vibration sensors there may only be one vibration sort of collection system, but there are many sensors over it. I mean, some of the big bearings will have four or five sensors as a minimum on them uh, and different types as well. So there, you know, some acceleration, uh, some maybe displacement, some other ones, some shock sensors. Uh, there's various different types of sensors again that are put in this. And then uh, you also find that some of the other sensors in the different sections, and say the parallel section or the other or, or the intermediate section, they can also other things within the turbine as well. So it's um, so there is a reasonable redundancy. Thanks, Tom. And Helen Gott says thank you. By the way, oh, okay. so, uh, our next question is from David Campbell. Um, as well as the condition monitoring techniques you mentioned, are acoustic emission detectors commonly used? Not currently, I would say. Uh, I think I, I've seen a few projects where people have tried to put them on. To be honest, I'm not sure how successful they've been. I know that they're supposed to be better for the slower moving systems, but I, I actually generally don't know if they've been successful or not. They're certainly not a standard fitted item. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from David Squirrel. How do you implement new technology if you require it to be proven? I guess it's a question for, for the both of you. I think. No. Yeah. yeah, um I think um verification and validation through testing. Um I think that's the only way um you can give confidence to the, the, the stakeholders who want to implement it. Um they need to see how it works and um in particular scenarios. So um being able to prove that is, is key. Uh, and a follow on from question from oh sorry Tom, please Ooh. go ahead. Can I can I just say one thing just just out there? We want technology to be done, but what you'll also find is if people come to us and say, "Oh, I've got some great stuff, and I want to put it on your offshore turbine," we say, "Have you put it on an onshore turbine yet?" Because trying to fit something where you can drive up to and walk in and try it is far, far easier than spending a few hours on a CTV and then transferring and doing all the different uh, uh, things and stuff you need to do to get onto the offshore turbines, etc. So it's like, "Oh yeah, perhaps you should do that." So sometimes it's it's steps. First, you want to try on a test rig, then you want to try to turbine and then go offshore. Great, thanks. Yeah, and maybe a bit of a, a plug for the catapult here. So apologies in advance. Um, but yeah, um, we have as part of our assets um, a just offshore um, uh, 
demonstration turbine um, off the coast of Fife, which is connected via bridge, which means it's much easier to access uh, than conventional wind farms. And yeah, we have installed a number of different technologies there to test them, improve them um, before they're put forward towards uh, commerciality. Great. And a very specific question here on the similar theme from Alexander Quayle. How do you test the bearings pre-installation? They seem particularly critical a particularly critical failure point and one that is fairly novel each time. OK, well, in some of the catapult might be able to uh, answer this because there are some test rigs around the world where you can test uh, drive trains and actually have proper dynamic testing where you can uh, put it under simulated loads to see how they behave. Um, do, can they test everything? No, because sometimes you get bearings and things that come out and they're fine and then you put them in the real field and they still fail. But that's life, unfortunately. Uh, the other thing to do is some of the suppliers also have their own test equipment. But again, trying to build massive test rigs for, say, four or five meter bearings, they're not cheating. So um, it's although it's so critical, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But I, I let Hamish, he might have a thought on this as well. Yeah, um, although it's not um, particularly in my field or within my team, I believe um, Ori Capital have um, a bearing test rig down in Blythe. Um, and but Tom's comments are true. Like um, you want to be able to test within um, certain parameters and um, certain conditions you, you might not experience um, in a representative environment. But yeah, it's it's it will still help um, prove that technology. Um, on, on lubrication here, is it possible to substitute grease with something else in these bearings? What is the future of bearing lubrication? Uh, I think it could be, but again, this is what would be an amazingly um, risky step for someone to actually start doing that. I, I'd like to see if we could get rid of grease, brilliant. Uh, I, I see no problems in doing that, but you just need a technology that can actually uh, uh, last uh, and actually do what it says it does. That's a very risky uh, thing to do. Thank you. Uh, and a question here from Jose Pedro Pagado de Silvanetto. Typically, the analysis of information from the different instruments is done manually by a person or intelligent digital algorithms um, are common. Are these systems turbine OEM specific. Sorry, I'll, I'll just say that again. Typically, the analysis of the information from the different instruments is done manually by a person or intelligently by algorithms. Are these common? Are these systems turbine specific, OEM specific? I'll take this one, shall I, Hamish? Um, basic, for, for turbines, yes, there, it's, there's far too much data. There is no way that a single person can be doing this. We have issues on, say, our sites that was 70 turbines. We know that there's been main bearing issues on them before in the past. It's You have to then check the different vibration sessions. But hang on, for each turbine, there's probably about, as uh, I say, a dozen sensors, and each one have different time monitoring on each one of those sensors to try and go through each one of them. It would take weeks, weeks just to go through the site once. And by that time, you, you might have already had a problem. So there's six systems out there that do do this and to be honest they're improving and the better ones we have multiple systems that are internally built and, and made with the company which try and take this data and put it all together and spot these four and if you've got problem with vibration on one thing and temperature on another thing and maybe some other parameter pressure or something and put them all together and when you've got all three of them then something comes up and that this sort of clever machine learning type uh, stuff well above what i can sort of understand half the time but very clever and very good and just so uh, sorry, add, please go ahead, Amish, yeah. yeah, sorry, just to add to that, as well as um, sensor data um, and improving uh, those processes, um, inspection images, <laughs> there could be thousands and thousands um, across a wind farm if you're looking at different blades or even subsea. Um, so uh, yeah, there's definitely efforts to try and include some machine learning in order to reduce the, the onus on the on a on a technician or evaluator um, on shore in order to go through these images um, and kind of pre-process them and make sure that and highlight particular uh, features of damage or areas of interest um, so that's another way um, the wind energy industry is trying to improve so we're now about halfway through our q a so i want to make some time to talk specifically about um leading leading edge erosion hamish so the last question we'll have on on the operational side is from john williams have you mentioned the importance of so you have mentioned the importance of filtration to what sort of micron size limit do you need to filter bearing lubricants 
it it very it very much um matters i think from system but for wind turbine gearboxes generally uh you'll have one sort of large uh highly you know large sort of um uh, relatively conventional filter should we say you the first you go through a magnetic filter to take out the real sort of boulders and, and chunks then you get a good idea of it if you can see anything coming then it goes into a sort of like a, a big fabric type filter uh, which will take just takes the flow because there's a such huge flow in some of these gearboxes i mean hundreds of liters a uh, minute type things then you get down to uh, this sort of what you call the polishing filters, the, the fine filtration, which is often in a bypass. And it's so you've got all the big stuff out of it. Those sit there trying to polish off the little stuff. And those go down to the sort of single micron type filters, those um, far um, deep depth filtration sort of systems that you see, like the CCN filters and other similar copuritons and like that. So it's down to the sort of fine microns is what you're trying to get to. The cleaner, the better always. Thanks, Tom. Um, Hamish, this is a question from David Skrill. Is there any technology transfer from aircraft wings to wind turbine blades? Uh, yeah, um, I think I, I kind of briefly mentioned it in the presentation, but um, yeah, metallic shields um, that have been have used before um, are, are being looked at right now. Um, but yeah, uh, I think there's there's still some way to go before they'll become a commercial solution. Um, a lot of things more to test, and um, but potentially, yeah, um, those those particular Legion Edge protection uh, solutions have proved well in that environment. But there's also there are a, a, a different inspection regime. You're able to land a, an airplane or a helicopter and inspect it regularly, um, where it, uh, it's difficult to get out to a, a, an offshore turbine. Um, so yeah. Definitely lessons learned or, or technology that can be applied, but um, still has to be applicable um, to the sector. Thanks, Hamish. Um, and a question now from Gintas Katinskas. Hello, thank you for the webinar. Thank you. Are wind, are wind turbine blades monitored specifically for leading edge erosion? If so, how? Um, pr primarily through schedule inspections. Um, that's uh, currently for, for a multi-million um, pound uh, asset, that uh, compared to the other sensing on the turbine, the blades um, don't include as much sensors. Um, so there are efforts to include some technology and um, to uh, analyze this remotely. Um, and potentially we'll see something um, down the line, um, a, a, a erosion sensor. Um, but in the meantime, it's, it's scheduled inspections through either rope access technicians, drone inspections or ground-based cameras. Um, and they'll be carried out um, Typically uh, biannually, I think, Tom, but um, there might, there'll be different um, uh, inspection regimes for different uh, owner operators. Yeah, d d depending on your turbine type, um, what protection you have on already and where they are located, because, for example, there is supposed to be a very large difference between whether your turbines are east or west coast of the country. Uh, obviously, to, sort of towards islands well known for being rough and more rain than off, say, the Norfolk way, you actually get less rain that side. It's, it's, it's quite um, quite a difference. And in fact, the amount of product you put on your blades uh, by the manufacturers is uh, separated by, by those locations as well. And, and aligned to that question, um, this is a question from Scott Haldane for, for you, Hamish. Um, what are your thoughts on the opportunity to implement the use of remote operation equipment, for example, uh, blade bug? for the monitoring and repairing of blade leading edges. Do you see this replacing technicians and the types of rope work these procedures require? Yeah, I, I think the concept um, is quite attractive uh, in terms of being able to um, reduce the amount of times technicians have to go out to shore, re re um, remove them from a, a quite a hazardous environment um, uh, and uh, potentially increasing the, the windows you're able to inspect or increase the, the frequency. Um, there are quite a few barriers or hurd hurdles to overcome on this de developmental pathway um, before we see a fully integrated solution um, which is able to uh, operate fully unmanned. But um, yeah, I think that has benefits for um, wind turbine blade inspection overall, but um, I think We'd like to see some um, further efforts in trying to reduce the problem um, rather than trying to reduce the repair as, as well. I think, um, yeah, uh, 
that, that, that would be um, my preference. But yeah, that, that's definitely, um, I think we'll, we'll start to see some more um, robotic implementations, not just for um, wind turbine blades, but uh, yeah, uh, other areas of the wind farm as well. Um, Thank you, Hamish. And on that note, my watch has told me it's now ticked over to the hour. So unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. A huge number of questions and we couldn't get through them all, I'm afraid. We will endeavour to get back to you if we can. Um, but thank you for all of your questions. Uh, but before we go, um, I wanted to, on behalf of all of us attending today and of course the IMAKE Tribology Group, to say a huge thank you to our speakers um, Tom and Hamish. Thank you both of you very much for your presentations today. I, we all very much appreciate it. And one last final thing before we close the call, I wanted to advise the next big event for the IMECI Tribology Group. It's the Surface Engineering for Sustainable Tribological Systems Seminar on the 10th of June. 2021. The, the details are on the screen there. It's an online event covering a range of surface engineering topics that are import important for our journey to net zero carbon with many speakers. So if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend that you attend. And there is an early bird discount booking ending on the 2nd of April. So on that note, thank you very much, everybody attending. Thank you for our speakers. And I will close the call. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Simon.